Hi everyone! So today I'm going to read the first short story I ever had published in print years ago, about 2011, 2012, uh, in the Sheep's Head Review, small magazine from the University of Wisconsin, Green Bay. And this story sort of is pretty meaningful to me in that it was my kind of first foray in sort of the weird uh, surrealist mode. So. Uh, this is called The Last Farmland in the Country. Holland Menners wasn't scared when he pulled the barn door open and saw his wife standing there in the yard with the shotgun aimed at him. He raised his hands, palms up, then let them fall to his sides as he sighed and muttered to himself, For fuck's sake, Lori. Before he could finish saying her name, Lori Ann pulled the trigger the blast of the gun sent the horse in the yard running toward the other end of the corral, and Holland Menners fell backward. When he woke up, Holland couldn't open his right eye. He felt no pain, just a throbbing, freezing feeling in his skin. When he reached up a hand, he felt dozens of tiny cuts in his lips and cheek, the skin torn and grated by the bird shot embedded in his flesh. His fingers patted at the puffy mess of his shut eye, soft and squishy like some gruesome pastry. Holland tried to smile, and he laughed as he hacked up a wad of, co of coagulating blood. Of course it was birdshot, he thought to himself. He shook his head and felt the start of a small wave of pain. Of course Larian wouldn't check the shells. Breathing through his nose, Holland winced as the air agitated the pellets stuck in his nostrils. He could smell smoke through the open door, though he could see that the air was clear. He shook his head again and stared at the bare rafters of the barn. The fires were getting closer. Soon enough, they'll come for the farm, he thought. He shut his eye and took another deep breath, wondering what it could feel like to stand in the center of those flames as they consumed the corn, as they scorched the ground and licked at his unmoving feet. Holland felt some sweat spindle down his forehead, Steeing the lacerations constellating his face. He heard footsteps and opened his left eye. The right eyelid remained closed, rigid and sealed over. Lorianne appeared, hands on her hips, a dish towel in her clenched fist. Lunch is ready. She turned to go, then spun back toward Holland. Clean yourself up before you come in stomping around my kitchen, will you? Holland watched her disappear across the grass, it was a grassy yard, separating the barn and the house. As he stood, stray bits of hay stuck to his palms, and his foot slipped on a few pieces that he had shoveled into a messy pile that morning. Holland looked up at Lorianne when she set the sandwich down in front of him. Her mouth was drawn tight, and she glanced toward him, then down at the sandwich, then back at his ragged cut mouth. She shrugged and sat down at the seat next to him at the square table in the center of the kitchen. I told you if I had to write that damn letter for you, I'd shoot you in the face. She slid a piece of paper that had been at the other end of the table toward Holland, shoving the plate aside as he reached down toward the sandwich, which she grabbed half of and took a large bite from. Didn't know you'd switched out the shells, she said between chews. Holland glanced at the letter and shrugged. His face was throbbing. He stared at Lorianne with his one good eye, who stared back. He watched her chew and swallow. God damn it, Holland, she said, tossing the sandwich back on the plate and grabbing up the paper. He watched her eyes as she read the letter, pupils flitting back and forth. She blinked a few times, lashes flicking. She looked at him. I know you think these things are pointless, but we have to do something. We have to try something. Lorianne pushed back her chair and stood, tossing the letter back onto the table. Just sign it, would you? Will you at least do that? Holland reached for the sandwich, but Lorianne swiped the plate from him. After, Holland. He exhaled and opened his mouth slowly, felt the cuts across his lips reopen. A dribble of blood tumbled down his chin, and he watched a few drops stain the white paper. He stared at them, then heard the plate Lorianne was holding crash against the metal tub of the sink. Oh God, Holland. Look. He looked up. Lorianne was staring out the window, mouth unhinged, lower lip protruding and tense. Holland ran his tongue over his own lips and tasted blood. He stood and stepped behind his wife. Through the window, he could see a thick column of smoke rearing into the sky beyond the trees in the distance. They're really here, Holland, she said. Her voice was quiet, pitching mid-sentence. 
He watched the cord of smoke as it billowed up and dissipated into the clouds, wondering how much his broken vision was distorting the smoldering dark vapor the fire was belching into the sky. Holland stared at the smoke as it spread into a wide curtain, stretching across the line of trees, flattening into a dark sheet. Holland looked down. Lorianne's hand was reaching back toward his. The pain in his face was growing, weltering up from a dull throb into dozens of tiny, fiery wasp stings. He looked at the side of Lorianne's face, could make out the shape of her nose and chin with his off-kilter vision. He could hear her shallow breathing and was aware of his own. She turned to look at him. He closed his good eye and shook his head, the pain waving over his skin like the heat from the fire that was closing in. Even if he'd been able to speak, he'd have had nothing to say. If he hadn't already been awake, lying on his back so as not to put pressure on his face, the itching would have woken him up. He'd been staring at the ceiling, feeling the skin around his eye, which had started bruising and crusting over like a prune. Then his whole body was dry as sandpaper, an intense prickly feeling crawling up and down his arms, the itch exploding across his chest. Holland pushed back the blanket and leapt out of bed. He heard Lorianne roll over and cover her head with a pillow. He dug his fingernails into his arms as he stumbled out of the bedroom and down the hall. In the dark, he couldn't see the trail he was leaving, but he felt skin flaking off in waves, marking his path to the kitchen. He stumbled past the table, knocked into one of the chairs, and reached to turn on the light, rubbing his hands over his arms and chest all the way. When he found the light switch and flicked it, the brightness stung his one good eye. What the hell are you doing, Holland? He spun around. Lorianne was standing in the doorway, staring at him. What the hell is going on? Holland swallowed and bit his lip. While he scratched it with his left hand, he ran his right hand over the surface of the table. He looked out the window. He couldn't separate the darkness of the night from the black smoke. Even though the fire had burned itself out hours before, the smell of charred, smoldering wheat and grass filled his nostrils. Holland's gaze fell back into the kitchen. He put both hands on the table and looked toward Lorianne whose eyes were wide, still wide, dark pools threatening to swallow him. His arms were shaking, itching, screaming. What is wrong with you? She crossed her arms. Holland looked around the room, then back at Lorianne, whose gaze hadn't left him. Couldn't she see it? Everything was covered. The floor, the tables, the chairs, all strewn with bits of straw and hay. The sound of Lorian knocking on the bathroom door surprised Holland, who was leaning over the sink, staring at himself. When he ran his fingers over his cheeks, they felt like burlap. The cuts scored into his skin from the birdshot had scabbed over, leaving crusty, hard bumps across his face. His lips were chapped and inelastic, the lacerations healing into inflexible scar tissue. Holland, he heard Lorian call to the door, come out here. He opened the bathroom door. She stood there hand on the handle of a suitcase. You haven't packed, she said. Holland's right eye had all but disappeared beneath a brown scab in the shape of a button. His vision had been skewed for days, but he'd adjusted to the warping sense of the space around him. So he could see the tears forming in her eyes. Holland started to open his mouth and fe felt the scabs in his cheeks and on his lips resist, threatening to tear and bleed again. He pressed them together. Why are you doing this, Holland? She crossed her arms and tapped her foot on the hardwood floor. Holland idly scratched his arm through the loose-fitting flannel shirt he was wearing. He could only wear flannel now. In anything else, the scratchy, itchy feeling was overwhelming. Everywhere he went, he left a trail of straw. Lorian refused to notice it or clean it up. It had started piling up in the hall, stuck in the corners of the bedroom, pools of it left behind when he got out of bed or stood up from the kitchen table. They'll be here soon, Holland. It's only a matter of time. He took a deep breath through his nose. He still had his nose. The burning, quixotic smell of engulfing flames was heavy in the air. For two days, the odor of scorched earth had lingered in the drapes, the sheets, the water, the food. It seeped in through the open windows in the barn loft, hung in the kitchen while he and Lorianne ate in silence. His bloodied letter was still sitting on the table, unsigned. I'm sorry I shot you, Holland, Lorianne let out a sputter of breath, a mix of a laugh and a sob, and tears started rolling down her cheeks. What a thing to say. 
She looked up at him, and for a moment Holland wanted to wipe her eyes, but he worried that his calloused, rough skin would scratch her. You're not coming with me, are you? Holland shook his head. She reached up and touched his scarred cheek. The feel of another hand on his coarse skin was almost soothing, cool. He hadn't been cool for days, and the throbbing in his cheeks tempered. He let her hand creep up his face, past his disfigured eye, linger on his forehead, before running through his brittle, crisp hair. When she touched it, he could almost hear it crack and snap. Could we have done anything? she asked, looking him in the one eye he had left. He could tell she didn't expect him to answer. Goodbye, Holland. She turned from him, and he watched her walk out, the bed out of the bedroom, resting his hands on either side of the doorframe. He stared toward the hallway, even though he could no longer see her, and he listened for the sound of the door closing. Even after he heard it thump shut, Holland stood there, staring at the empty space before him. He could no longer smell the smoke in the air, or the haystack in the barn, or the muddy manure in the pasture. Holland sat with his head in his hands. His fingers had all but disappeared, tufts of straw and the nub nubs of arms poking out through the sleeves of his shirt. He had willed them not to, had stared at them for hours, asking, praying for them to stop receding, to stop shrinking back. He tried to cry, willed himself to tears, but nothing came. Barely able to see, he kicked his bare foot. His boots had become too heavy for his legs to support. At the barn door, spraying hay across the ground. Holland heard the, the cawing of a small cluster of birds perched on the windowsill of the loft. They'd been there for two days now, just sitting there, staring at him. When he stumbled across the yard, holding a hat down on his head to stunt the discomforting feeling of his hair being blustered about and yanked out by the wind, they followed him, hovering, squawking, some of them diving toward his arms and forcing him to wave them away. When he entered the empty house, they waited for him to come back outside, perched on the rail of the front porch. When he finally dragged himself from the barn, the letter was waiting for him, tossed toward the door like some discarded newspaper. The birds stared at him from the rail. He didn't bother bending down to pick the letter up. He didn't need to open it to know what, who it was from or what it said. Two days to pack up any personal belongings and leave. After that, if you were still there, they weren't responsible for what might happen to you. He left the letter where it was. Holland stood there for a moment and looked across the street. Just yesterday, the neighboring field had been torched, and Holland had watched the flames lick and beckon toward him, pointing and flicking as if to say, soon. Soon, we will be there. The heat they gave off wasn't as intense as he'd expected. Didn't burn like he'd hoped. The birds, despite the crackling heat, had stared at him as he watched. Now, as he looked over at the dark, rotting field, one of them flew over and perched on his shoulder. When he didn't resist and just kept staring with his hazy, dimming vision, another bird, and then another, and another, fluttered over to him, digging claws into his soft skin, gripping his bones and looking out at the field with him. He was the only one who could hear the swish of their dark feathers. He was standing in the barn when it happened. He'd been there all morning, waiting for the fire. He wanted to see it start, wanted to know how they did it. Was it one person that set flame to the brittle, dusky cornstalks, some nameless soldier who would, with a trembling hand, toss a torch into the field? Or someone important, someone Holland might recognize, or at least some colonel or general, at whose hand would his home disappear? And would they set it in the middle of one of the fields, or on the edge? Would they stick around to make sure everything was burned up, or would they slink away, disappear before it was finished? Holland would never know, because as he stood there, holding his body up with a pitchfork while the birds swarmed in the loft, everything went dark. His vision had been dim, Fuzzy as though he'd been squinting out of his one eye, and all of a sudden even that was snuffed out. For a moment he just stood there in the singular darkness, listening to the birds flapping and chirping above. Their number had increased. He wasn't sure what they would eat when the crops were gone. Dropping the pitchfork, Holland reached up and ran his hand over the spots where his eyes had been. They disappeared beneath thick calluses, hard and impenetrable. He could barely feel the pressure of his fingers on his face. Holland took a step forward and caught his leg on one of the pitchfork's extended teeth. He tried to steady himself, but he tripped and fell forward, arms out in front of him. As he fell, Holland managed to turn, and, leading with his shoulder, landed in the pile of hay. 
He felt a crunch, but no pain, and he managed to roll onto his back. A strange melting sensation overcame him, like water dripping off his skin, and he felt his head and arms, everything not protected by his flannel shirt, sinking into the hay. He heard the birds stir, and then felt one of them, then a second, a third, the whole flock, pour down from the loft and land on the disordered pile. He felt them crawl over his shirt and peck at its buttons. They waddled toward his face, flapping their wings and cooing over him. They started tearing at the fabric, dragging the shirt apart in their beaks. When the flannel finally gave, hay and straw spilled out like viscera, spreading into the pile. And then, when Holland tried to lift his arms to shoo them away, a new sensation. Not only could he not lift them, he couldn't find his own arms. He felt hay all around him, in him, dragging him down into itself, but he could not locate his arms and legs. He couldn't feel them, couldn't move. He couldn't do anything. Holland Menners realized then that he couldn't feel his own heartbeat. His own chest had melted into the hay. The only sound was the pattering of the bird's wings. Then came a loud whoosh, and the birds flew up away from him, cawing and screeching, and Holland knew, without seeing or smelling it, that the flames had come. Somewhere, not far off, his farm was being set on fire. Why couldn't he taste the crisp burning in the air? Holland laid there for a while, knowing he could do nothing else. He could hear the popping of the fire, the vacuum of heat as it pulled oxygen from the air, and he knew it was spreading across his fields, and that it would arrive at the barn in only a few minutes now. Staring toward the ceiling, imagining his transformed face smiling up at the rafters and the birds, unable to flex, unable to move, his body lost among the disarray of hay and straw, Holland wanted to close his eyes, wanted to inhale and feel the sharp smell of ash and smoke in his sinuses and lungs. He wanted to be out in the field, standing among his defenseless crops, putting up some show of defiance. But he could do nothing. He could only lie there, the remains of a flaccid flannel shirt the only evidence of his body, the only remainder of a life going up in flames, and wait for the fire to come. The end.